This is going to be the first of two lectures covering feathers, which is one of the first things that people think about when they think about birds. There are three basic functions of feathers. Insulation, which is going to be particularly important for those living at extreme latitudes. Communication, we'll see that colors uh, of feathers are also very important in things like species recognition and mate choice. And then we have some uh, pretty brilliantly colored feathers and also highly modified feathers for visual signals. And then probably what you think of most when you think of feathers, and that is flight. Let's look at the basic structure of a feather. So this is a flight feather. We'll talk about the different types of, of feathers. But if you look at a flight feather, we have a proximal and distal end. The proximal end is where it is actually inserting into the skin. The distal end is the tip of the feather that's farthest away from the body. Now, if we have a feather like a contour feather or a flight feather like this, it has this nice integrated surface. That is what we call the vein. Now running down the middle of the vein is the rachis or support shaft. So this is the rachis. But the rachis again has the vein associated with it. Proximal to that we have the calamus or quill. Now if you look at the vein there are two main types of veins. And when we typically talk about a vein, we're talking about the pinaceous part of the feather or that that is integrated. But there can also be barbs, usually at the proximal end, that come off and just have this fluffy appearance to them. They don't have this nice integration. That's the plumulaceous region. All right, well, what gives a certain region of a feather the pinaceous form versus the plumulaceous form? Well, if we look at detail, so coming off of the rachis, we have individual feather components called barbs. So the branches coming off of the rachis are the barbs, and the barbs themselves have their own individual branches coming off called barbules. Now the barbules that are closer to the calamus, or the closer to the body of the bird, those are the proximal barbules. Those on the other side of the barb are the distal barbules. Now if we look at that up close, there's an important distinction between the proximal and distal barbules. When we're talking about a very nicely pinaceous feather, what holds it together is the fact that the distal barbs have these little hooklets on them. And these hooklets actually grab on, kind of like Velcro, to proximal barbules on the next barb. And we can see that kind of better here. We've got two uh, barbs with proximal barbules sticking off here, then we have the distal barbules sticking over and overlapping the proximal barbules of the next barb. And they actually grab hold with these hooklets. So probably a lot of you have picked up a, a feather that you find walking in the woods somewhere and you can unzip the vein, right? You can separate the individual barbs, but if you're careful, for a little bit at least, you can zip those back and what you're doing is you're replacing that orientation of the hooklets on the distal barbules onto the proximal barbules that they're overlapping. Now you also may notice that if you do that enough, right, if you keep unzipping it and zipping it back, it gets to the point where you can't get them to stick together. And what you've done in that situation is you've broken off those hooklets. And so it's, you're not able to maintain that. Well, so that's what happens in the nice pinaceous region. What about the plumulaceous region? Well, if you look at the, the barbules that are coming off the barbs there, they don't have this nice hooklet structure. Um, they're oftentimes longer and they're more thread-like in appearance. And so they, they don't have the capability of forming that nice integrated uh, vein-like smooth surface. The feathers themselves are made up of uh, beta keratin, and this is also a, a primary a substance found in scales and claws. And we'll see that feathers, once they grow in, that's dead material. So as they're growing, yes, there is blood connection to those. But once that material has uh, finished its growth, the blood supply is cut off and that feather is a dead structure. Feathers grow from follicles and the follicles are basically in just invaginations of the epidermal tissue. Here's one you can see on the right. So all of this right here is epidermis sticking down and the underlying support structure is the dermis. And we'll see that the follicles are not evenly spread across the body. You can see follicles in this chicken here and that's why I've got this uh, picture so that you can see those little bumpy regions uh, are where a follicle was. So how do feathers grow? Well, feathers grow initially in a tubular pattern, like a little bump coming out of the follicle. 
And if you look at them in cross section, you see that they have this epidermal collar and the, the growth is actually going to occur in this ring-like structure. So that as it grows out, it grows out as a tube, and this is a simplification. We'll see in more detail what's going on here in a minute. But that tube splits so that the rachis serves as the centerpiece, and then the barbs split across from that, such that the inside becomes the bottom of the wing, or the bottom of the, the uh, feather. So it becomes the ventral surface, and the outside becomes the dorsal surface of the feather. And that's what we can see here. So this, in these uh, macaws, the blue seen here in these feathers, that's the dorsal part of the feather. So that would have come from the outside of the, the tube here. But the inside, in this case, in these birds, it's red. Um, that would have come from the inside of this. So let's look at this kind of tube-like structure in more detail. So remember, it's coming from this epidermal collar that's uh, growing out of the follicle in this tube-like structure. But the barbs actually form from this epidermal collar along a barb ridge. And so here you can see in, in uh, a stained slide, you can see the barbed ridges. They're coming off of this epidermal collar. And here you can see kind of a, a graphic of it. So here's the epidermal collar. Here you can see the barb ridges. And these barb ridges, they migrate to the rachis ridge. So this is going to form the rachis. And so here we can see a, in cross section, again, a stained slide of the rachis ridge. So as it grows out, these barbs are rotating around from the epidermal collar as they grow and migrating to make this connection with the rachis ridge. So as the feather grows, it emerges from these wax-like structures called sheaths. And at this point, they're called pin feathers. And at this point, they're highly vascularized. So if you are doing a study where you're handling birds that are molting, either nestlings or adults that are molting, then it's really important not to damage those. If you do damage one and it starts bleeding, it's important to go ahead and just pull that feather out because that will actually allow clotting to occur. If you damage the feather and uh, you don't pull it out, there's going to be continued agitation of that feather and there's a chance that the bird could lose a substantial amount of blood. So um, that's the general idea is to go ahead and pull those pin feathers out. Now during growth, growth, we'll talk about the growth part of the feather. When a bird is replacing its feather, it's called molting. And during the molting process, um, feathers grow gradually and the if there are different nutritional states that the bird is in, you can actually see that as what are called fault bars in the feathers it grows in. So this was a time period where the bird was doing pretty good, but then we see that there was some nutritional stress associated with this bird, and so it allows us to kind of understand uh, some stressful uh, events that may occur in a bird if you're doing some behavioral study. So how did feathers evolve? So when you talk about the evolution of a complex structure, for it to evolve by natural selection, you have to be able to explain how the structure could evolve in phases with each phase being slightly more adaptive than the previous phase. That's the only way natural selection is going to mold a trait that is an adaptation. Now the old hypothesis was that feathers were derived from scales that simply became lighter and uh, frayed to provide maybe some insulation and, and then also a flight surface. But it turns out that if we look at it genetically, uh, feathers and scales really are not homologous. And our new hypothesis is that they have evolved from these hollow tube-like uh, structures that started off with just, you know, like these hollow tubes, kind of like just these filaments. And we're going to see that there's some evidence of this in early dinosaurs, in early theropods, actually before theropods. So this was the first stage. Now, what could have been the function of that at that point? Um, well, even that could have provided some mechanosensory uh, functions, perhaps even some very limited thermal, thermal regulation capacity, um, maybe some coloration. We're going to see that there's evidence of coloration in early feathers of, of dinosaurs. But the next step would be to have the individual barbs coming out there. And this would have produced down. And down is definitely capable of thermal regulation. So this would have been a very important step up uh, in an advancement as far as an adaptive function of feathers. The next stage would be to have taken that initial presence of, of barbs, but have those barbs grow along across 
a larger structure called the rachis, right? And so here we have the individual barbs not just coming out of the calamus or quill, but actually having this extended rachis. Now you could have still maintained that, and so this could have provided a little bit of extra covering and, and maybe protective covering for some underlying uh, down type feathers. But to hold that together better, then we would see the evolution of barbs, um, but those, allowing those barbs to stick together the next phase would be having the distal barbules have the hooklets that would provide this nice supportive integrative vein, which provide even a better outside coat to the individual. But this would also allow for the potential evolution of more specialized feathers in the last stage, like the flight feathers. And then also um, some of the more bizarre kind of feathers associated with with display uh, in courtship. So I mentioned that we do have evidence of uh, some very early non-avian reptile lineages having feathers. So and again, it can predate even the theropods. And these are the ones that did have those hollow tubular feathers as shown here. But we even see modern pinaceous feathers. So feathers with nice integrated veins evolving in taxa that predate true birds. So here we have a dromaeosaur fossil and if you look at it up close, so in this little box here, if you look at that up close, you can see um, a nice feather structure. So you can see individual barbs coming off of this nice rachis, this central rachis. We even see evidence in some of the better fossils that preserve some remarkable detail that there's evidence of color patterns in some of these theropod feather fossils. We know this by looking at, see these red dots are showing some of the areas that were looked at in detail under a electron uh, microscope. You can see that they had what are called melanosomes. And melanosomes are bodies in cells that store melanin. Not only that, but we can tell by the structure of the melanin in these melanosomes what sort of colors there could have been. And so here's a reconstruction, including some uh, grays and blacks and, and, and browns, and even the potential, in some cases, for iridescent colors due to the relative stacking of the melanin in the melanosomes. We'll talk about color formation and iridescence in a later lecture. All right, so um, that's basically what a feather is and the basic parts of a feather. Um, the entire coat of feathers that a bird has, we call that the plumage. And again, we're, this is a, a similar theme. Birds want to stay as lightweight as possible. And yes, the term light as a feather does indicate that individual feathers are light, but collectively, the plumage equals about 5 to 10% of a bird's weight, which actually is even greater than the weight of the skeleton. It's about two to three times the weight of the skeleton in most birds. So, uh, feathers are light, but you still need to minimize the number of feathers that you have. And so feathers are really not even sp evenly spread on the skin. They come out of follicles that are concentrated in certain areas so that their distribution can cover up bare parts of the skin, but they're not spread evenly. And so this is just a weight saving, feather reducing uh, capability. The feathered regions are called terula, which are showed stippled here, the terula. The parts that feathers do not grow from are called ateria. Now this again helps to serve, this serves the purpose of reducing weight by reducing the number of feathers, but we'll see that there's actually some reasons why you don't want to have feathers in certain regions um, by allowing, so for example in hot environments, allowing wind to get to these uh, bare patches, it can allow birds to thermoregulate. Well, so how do birds control the position of their feathers? We'll talk about how some feathers actually help them understand the distribution of uh, the larger feathers, um, the phyloplumes. But they also have small muscles that are uh, attached to the feathers at the base of the follicle and that allows uh, fine movement and uh, organization of the feathers in the plumage. So as I mentioned, uh, the ateria serve one function and that's allowing birds to shed heat. Uh, we can see this behaviorally in birds that are overheated. They can elevate their feathers to uh, allow the wind to get closer to the skin to drive off some heat. We talked about that in a previous lecture. And we see that birds that really don't ever have to deal with that but have to deal with the opposite, um, have to deal with retaining heat, they actually lack uh, ateria. Uh, 
so they have a more even coat of feathers uh, and more evenly spread plumage and that makes sense and that's particularly true of penguins which don't even have to worry about uh, weight limitations because they don't fly. All right, well, let's, I've been hinting at different feather types. Let's talk in more detail about the feather types. So going left to right here, we have these two types of feathers, which are generally referred to as the flight feathers. The flight feathers of the tail are called the rectrices. The flight feather of the wings we'll see are referred to as remiges, and there are two different types of remiges that we'll talk about. But the flight feathers have a very obvious dominated uh, vein of pinaceous region with just a little bit of plumulaceous region um, at the base where the calamus or quill ends and the rachis begins. There are two feathers that are really more responsible for thermal re regulation than anything else. These are the semi-plumes and the down. Now the difference between semi-plumes and down is notice that the semi-plume has this nice rachis that runs the entire length. Down does not have much of a rachis. If it has a rachis, it's a relatively short rachis, and the barbs are longer than the rachis. In the case of, of a semi-plume, the longest barb is shorter than the rachis. That's the definition between a semi-plume and a down. Now, covering up both of these feathers are the contour feathers. The contour feathers are basically most of the feathers are what you see in a bird besides the wing and the tail. The, they give the bird a nice smooth contour by overlapping each other. And so you usually don't see the plumulaceous region, you just see the pinaceous region of a contour feather uh, in a bird. Now, we do have two hair-like feathers uh, in birds, but again, these are not hair. The phyloplume or mechanosensory, so they're helping the bird feel oftentimes the distribution of feathers so that their muscles can control their, their uh, placement. Bristles tend to be much larger and uh, thicker, and they also serve mechanosensory uh, functions, but in a very different way, oftentimes associated with the bill and sometimes the feet. Okay, down, as I mentioned, uh, no vein, uh, no integrated pinaceous region. They're all plumulaceous. Again, a very small or no rachis, and their function is insulation. Now, there are different types of down. The down that a bird is first born with is called natal down. And natal down can be very prominent in uh, birds that are precocial or birds that are actually hatching with a large amount of feathers. Uh, but some birds don't. Some birds have very minimal natal down when they first hatch or um, none at all. Uh, and they have to, to grow that uh, in their first few days. So it tends to be thicker in the precocial young. And especially those uh, species living in really cold environments. Now these the natal down actually grows from follicles spread out all over the body, including follicles that will eventually be used for other uh, feather purposes. The next type of down is what we see in adults, uh, and this is body down, and it does grow from its own follicles. The amount of uh, body down that we see in adult birds varies depending on where they live, so if it, we're talking about an arctic or subarctic species, uh, then they're going to have a lot of down, right, because they need to uh, keep warm. Tropical species tend to not have much down, also not have a lot of semi-plumes. The reason I have this picture here is this is actually a, I think it's an eider. Uh, it's some kind of very northern breeding duck. And what birds in this region oftentimes do is they actually pluck some of their own down and line their nest with it to kind of help insulate the nest during growth. But it also serves an, another purpose. They're, they're plucking the down from their breast area so that it allows more efficient contact of the skin uh, brood patch that the adult is producing so that they can transfer heat to the eggs more efficiently. So we'll talk about that when we talk about incubation behavior and nesting. There's another type of down that's relatively rare. It's only seen in herons and pigeons and some parrots called powder down. Powder down is a kind of very simple feather that just kind of grows out and then disintegrates into this fine powder. It apparently has several functions. In some cases it has uh, the capability of preventing parasites or helping to dislodge parasites or uh, dissuade them from uh, attacking uh, the host feathers. But it can also provide some waterproofing and that is particularly important in some of the herons. Now let's move on to the feather that looks kind of like down, but again, it has a much more substantial rachis. It has a rachis, and some remember some down doesn't, or a small rachis. 
but it also has just typically these really um, uh, plumulaceous regions coming off of the rachis. So the barbs are not finding this nice integration. Again, their primary function uh, being underneath, in most cases, the contour feathers is insulation. But some of them have been modified to extend past that and have been modified to produce these visual displays, which are oftentimes used in courtship. So that's what we're seeing here in this egret. Now talking about the hair-like feathers, the really teeny tiny, uh, very thin ones are called phyloplumes. And again, they're tactile. So they're mechanoreceptors and they help to monitor the position of feathers. Much larger and stiffer type of feathers are the bristles. And these really are hair-like. Um, they are usually found around the head. If they're found around the mouth, they're called rictal bristles at the base of the bill and they help a bird sense where prey is while they're trying to subdue it. So it's oftentimes seen in aerial insectivores in, very prominently. Sometimes it can be seen to cover up the nasal uh, openings in the bill. And so it provides a protective function in that case. So in the lab, look at the uh, crows and ravens. They have very dense bristles that cover their nasal openings. Some birds actually have pretty nice eyelashes that are produced by these bristles. Uh, so that you can see it here. Uh, if you look at an ostrich, it also uh, shows that. And some of the aerial insectivores, again, it just helps to provide some protection to the eyes. So the function of these uh, oftentimes are sensory or protective. Uh, when it's sensory, sometimes they can be found in uh, nocturnal species oftentimes that um, have bristles associated with their feet. Let's talk a little bit more about flight feathers though. Flight feathers are the large vein feathers of the wing and the tail. And as I mentioned previously, the wing feathers are the remiges and the tail feathers are the rectrices. We focus on the remiges for a minute. These are the flight feathers of the wing and we can break these up into two categories. The primaries are the ones shown in green here. The purple ones here are called the secondaries. And the number of these varies from group to group but in all cases, they're numbered from the middle part of the wing. So if you look at the area that, that separates the primaries from the secondaries, that's where you start one, and the primaries are numbered from the uh, medial aspect distally, and then from that middle part, proximally, you number the secondaries. Well, how do you know where they start and begin? I mean, what, what distinguishes a primary from a secondary? It's primarily where they attach. So the, if you look at the remiges, they attach via ligaments to different bones. The primaries are attaching to the manus. The secondaries are attaching to the ulna. And if you look at an ulna, these little bumps that are on here, these protuberances, these are calcified areas where the uh, feather is attaching to that ulna. If you look at the wing of a bird, you'll notice that the uh, primaries at the tips are much more asymmetrical than those that are more medial. And we'll talk about this as an important aspect of flight dynamics, uh, aerodynamics later, the physics of flight. So if you look at a, a tip primary feather, it'll look like this. This anterior vein, the one it's facing forward, is much thinner than the posterior vein. And oftentimes it has a notch associated with it, kind of midway. This will allow actually some separation of these wing feathers to actually, they act almost like individual little wings. So we'll talk about the importance of that, particularly in species with broad wings to, to reduce the amount of drag that they have. Some other modifications of primaries include modifications that allow them to make sounds. So if you look at a woodcock in their flight display, and we do have some woodcock that nest down here in Texas during the winter time. So if you go out right at uh, sunset, you can sometimes in, in the right habitat, you can hear these uh, woodcock displaying. American woodcock painting an aerial display. Now that's a, actually a vocal part, but listen to the trill. That latter part there, that is the part that is uh, produced by modified primaries. Now the opposite end of that are birds that don't want to make any noise while they're flying, and that it includes most owls. So they have these really fine 
modifications of their barbules that give it this soft pile coat and then also these fringed tips that work to uh, reduce the amount of, of sound reverberations as the wind goes over their wings. Other modifications or primaries include those to make a visual display. So this is a standard winged night jar, which has this modified primary to, to make these flags used in courtship. Moving on to modifications of the secondaries. So um, this is a club wing mannequin, and this is a male on the left that is displaying to a female on the right, and they make these really loud popping clicking sounds by beating together some of their secondaries that have been modified into these like castanet-like structures. So here's a close-up of what some of these look like. So we're looking at secondaries five, six, and seven, and you can see that six has these ridges on it, and there's this club-like uh, feature to five so that you can beat five and rub it against that to make this stridulation-like uh, sound. But they do it really, really fast, and it makes a, a popping-like sound. So here's an interesting article. Hopefully you can see that. Um, I, I'm not able to play that right now, but uh, I'd like you to, to play this. I think it'll give you a greater appreciation for what these club wing mannequins are doing with these secondaries. Secondaries can also be modified for visual displays. And so in a, this duck here, this mallard, these are the secondaries and they form this visual display, which is called the speculum. Moving on to rectrices, again, these are the flight feathers of the tail. They're attached to the, those fused caudal vertebra called the, that make up the pygostyle. And while there is some lift generated by tail feathers, we'll talk about that when we talk about flight dynamics, um, the main function of tails from a flight standpoint is steering and braking. But the other thing that you notice about uh, tail feathers oftentimes is they're highly elongated or modified to form uh, visual display functions and sometimes sound functions as well. One other function that you see in some birds that are creepers or wood, woodpeckers that are creeping along branches is they have highly stiffened rectrices like in this woodpecker here and they basically use their tail almost like a third leg where they can brace themselves on a trunk as they move up and down. Lastly, let's talk about contour feathers. Again, these just give a bird a nice smooth contour. So they uh, cover the down semi-plume feathers and the base of the flight feathers, giving that bird a nice streamlined aerodynamic profile. But oftentimes, they're also very brightly colored and used in communication. Again, the tips of the contour feathers are pinaceous and the underlying uh, proximal part are plumulaceous. And so they may also help in some regards with insulation. Contour feathers are interesting with regard to how they deal with water depending on how loosely the spacing of the barbs and barbules are. It turns out that if the barbules uh, and barbs are not tightly packed, it actually allows them to be better at shedding water. It makes them more waterproof. Now sometimes helping along with this are oils from a gland that we'll talk about later called the uropigial gland which is found at the base of the uh, tail, this bird on the right here is actually gathering oils from its uropigial gland right there. So in combination with the oils and then the loosely spaced barbs and barbules, uh, birds are pretty good at shedding water from their feathers. Um, as the term goes, you know, shedding water like off the back of a duck. But some birds don't want to do this. Some birds actually don't want to uh, have too much air trapped underneath their feathers. They actually want to have water adhere to their feathers and absorb that so that they can dive more efficiently. And it turns out that uh, tightly spacing causes water to adhere to these feathers and allows them to dive more efficiently like in this anhinga. Problem with that though is once they get out of the water and they want to potentially fly again, they have to dry their feathers out. And so you'll see anhingas spreading their wings uh, after diving to dry them out. One final point about a contour feather is some birds have what is called an aftershaft, which is a secondary shaft coming off the calamus or quill that produces more of a semi-plume-like feather that's attached to the more contour-like part of the feather. And this may provide some extra insulation or in some species, 
provide uh, some display function like an emu. It's not seen in a lot of birds. Uh, it's found in emus and then uh, grouse have this. And then finally, uh, contour feathers I mentioned can be modified with brilliant colors for oftentimes we'll see species recognition, but also more importantly, mate choice. And that's why males tend to be brighter colored in most species of birds than females. But also the shape of the contour feathers can vary, as you see here in this crowned crane and this palm cockatoo with their kind of crest-like st structures. All right, that'll do it for this lecture. In the next lecture, we'll talk more about the molting process itself and how birds really work hard to keep their feathers in good shape. And we'll spend a lot of time talking about what gives different feathers different colors.